No private fireplaces, no warm bedrooms, no thermostat glowing on the wall. In the Viking world, winter didn't arrive gently. It arrived wet snow that turned to sleet sleet, that turned to rain, and a salt wind off the sea that never seemed to stop breathing. Darkness stretched for months and moisture never truly left the air. Even indoors you could feel it cold that didn't just sit still, cold that moved. Most people think winter kills with cold. It doesn't. It kills by draining heat, slowly, quietly, hour after hour, while you sleep. That's why Viking survival is so unsettling. In many long houses, there was no fireplace for each person, no private hearth to curl up beside, no personal flame to hide behind when the wind sharpened and your clothes stayed damp for days. And yet whole families survived the deadliest winters in Northern Europe because Vikings didn't depend on fire the way we do. They assumed fire would fail, fuel runs, out wet wood smokes, smoke chokes, flames die, so they built systems that still worked when fire could not. They treated warmth like a resource, you protect not a feeling you chase. Tonight you'll see five Viking heat systems, passive, silent, and ruthless, built from space bodies, materials, and placement. Each one targets a different kind of heat loss, like ceiling leaks in a ship before it sinks. Vikings didn't fight winter with fire, they outsmarted it. Night inside a Viking longhouse did not feel open, it felt compressed, low heavy, contained. The roof pressed downward, the walls leaned inward, and the air, the most important part of all, barely moved. Outside, the North Atlantic wind never rested. It rolled in soaked with moisture, scraping over sea and tundra. Cold air was dangerous, but moving air was deadly because moving air strips warmth off skin faster than your body can replace it. You can tolerate cold that sits. You cannot tolerate cold that hunts. Modern thinking imagines Viking houses as crude shelters warmth as an accident from a fire. But Vikings did not build houses to make heat. They built them to trap it. A long house was not just a room. It was a thermal system. Thick walls of earth turf stone and timber were thermal mass. Once warmed by bodies, lamps cooking, and any shared hearth, those walls resisted temperature change and slowed heat loss hour after hour. The goal wasn't hot. The goal was stable because stability lets you rest, and rest lets you survive. The roof stayed low on purpose. Less vertical space meant less air to heat. Warmth stayed where people lived close to the ground, close to bodies, rather than rising into a tall, wasted ceiling. A low roof also reduces exposed surface area to the wind outside. Less surface, less loss. Doors were narrow and often offset from the wind. Narrow openings reduce the rush. Offset placement breaks the straight line of airflow. Even opening the door did not fully reset the interior. The house didn't inhale the storm every time someone stepped inside. Inside, there were no private rooms, no corridors, no dividing walls. Interior walls split heat into smaller zones, increase surface area, and invite drafts. And drafts are theft. The Vikings refused to multiply cold edges inside their own shelter. So the solution was one shared space, one thermal envelope. People slept worked repaired tools and ate inside the same heated volume. Tools, animals, bodies, and walls all contributed to one heat balance. When warmth is scarce, you don't spread it thin. You keep it concentrated. Modern homes often do the opposite. We seal the building envelope tightly, then divide it into empty rooms. We heat air instead of mass, space instead of people, and we pay for it fuel money and a house that feels cold the moment the system stops. The longhouse accepted a harder truth. Heat is limited, so protect it. No wind, no escape. Heat stayed. They didn't survive winter by adding more fire. They survived by closing exits. Once the longhouse trapped heat, Vikings asked the next question. 
what heat do we actually have? Because in deep winter, fire can be unreliable. So Vikings treated something else as the primary heat source, people. Inside the long house, winter did not respect privacy. Families slept together, warriors, elders, servants, sometimes animals close by. This wasn't simply crowded living. It was physics, and in winter, physics doesn't negotiate. At 20 the C, one human body struggles to protect itself through an entire night. Heat leaks through skin breath and movement slowly at first, then faster as fatigue sets in. Shivering consumes fuel, and once fuel drops, cold accelerates. That's the trap. The colder you get, the more energy you burn, and the less energy you have. Vikings understood a single body is fragile, but bodies together form a system. Sleeping was organized. Children went at the center. Small bodies, fast heat loss, protected first. Adults formed an outer ring. Larger bodies, more thermal mass, better able to absorb cold and slow it. The arrangement wasn't sentimental. It was structural like layering shields. Gaps were minimized. Wool fur and skin overlapped. Every exposed surface is a place heat can escape, so exposure was reduced. When bodies touched, heat stopped vanishing into open air. It circulated. It accumulated. One person's loss became another person's gain. The goal was not to feel warm. The goal was to stop cooling. Clustered bodies reduce exposed surface area. Less surface, less loss, more time. And time changes everything. Time means fewer wake-ups, fewer shivering cycles, less panic, more sleep. And sleep in winter is not comfort. It's recovery. It's tomorrow's strength. Isolation was dangerous. A lone sleeper loses heat from all sides. Every movement resets the microclimate. Every breath escapes into empty air. The cold doesn't have to fight you. It just waits while you spend your body's heat into nothing. So Vikings accepted closeness, compression, shared discomfort, because in winter distance kills. Modern life quietly pushes us the other way. Separate rooms, separate beds heated space instead of heated people. We call it comfort, but it also means your warmth depends on a system staying on. The Vikings build warmth from bodies living, breathing infrastructure. They survived it together. With the human system in place, Vikings confronted the next thief of heat, the one that doesn't move and never gets tired, the ground. Inside a longhouse, the floor was earth-packed soil, often damp. It felt quiet. Still, and that is what made it deadly. The ground doesn't shock you. It drains you patiently until your core temperature starts to slip. Cold ground drains heat continuously through contact, minute after minute, hour after hour. Air might sting, but the ground conducts. It pulls warmth out like a sink pulling water down a drain. If you lie directly on it, you can feel fine at first and then wake up weaker than when you fell asleep. So Vikings didn't sleep on the ground. They lifted themselves above it. Platforms were low, impractical wooden planks on short support stones used as feet. Nothing decorative, just enough height to change the physics of the night. Those few centimeters did three things they broke conductive heat loss. They created a pocket of dead air beneath the body, and they protected insulation from being crushed. Bedding only works when it traps air. Wool grass hides, none of it insulates because it's thick. It insulates because it holds tiny pockets of air. Compress it flat and you destroy the pockets. The layer becomes a cold pad. More layers on top don't fix it if you crush the base. By lifting the body, Vikings kept grass hides and wool lofted dry enough to function thick enough to breathe. The platform also reduced moisture wicking up from soil into bedding. Separation became survival. Heat stayed where it belonged around the body inside the layers. Sleep deepened. Shivering slowed. Energy was conserved for the next day. And when winter lasts for months, conserving energy is the difference between enduring and failing. Modern mistakes repeat the same pattern. We add layers, then crush them. 
We sweat into them, turning insulation into a conductive sponge. Then we wonder why the cold comes back at 4 a.m. Vikings didn't pile layers blindly. They separated them. Ground below, body above, air in between. They didn't defeat the cold ground. They stopped touching it. With the ground controlled, winter revealed its next weapon moisture. Viking winters were wet. Snow turned to sleet. Sleet to rain. Fog crept in from the sea and never fully left. Clothing stayed damp. Fur grew heavy. Smoke clung. And water changes the rules because water collapses insulation. Wet fabric kills faster than cold air. When cloth becomes wet, it collapses. Air pockets disappear. Heat escapes faster with every breath. You can have a warm house and still lose the fight if your clothing becomes a wet heat pump pulling warmth out of you. So Vikings chose a material that behaved differently, wool. Northern European wool keeps trapping air even when damp. Each fiber bends and crimps instead of laying flat. That structure holds space and trapped space becomes insulation. Wool can hold moisture and still keep enough trapped air to slow heat loss. In other words, it fails slowly, not suddenly. Wool was worn as a system. Soft, finer wool near the skin managed moisture, absorbing, spreading, and releasing it gradually. Coarser wool outside blocked wind and held shape when wet. Animal skins slowed rain and trapped warmth beneath acting like a moving windbreak. And Vikings did something modern people resist. They did not always change clothes at night. Once warmed, a stable microclimate formed between skin and cloth, removed the layers, and that heat vanished instantly into the longhouse air. The body would then spend precious energy buying it back exactly when fuel is lowest and the night is longest. Dry mattered less than consistent. Damp, still warm. Heavy, still alive. Slow to dry, but not dead. Modern gear often promises quick, dry comfort, and that matters. But in extreme cold, some synthetics lose insulation when wet, and as temperatures drop, they can stiffen or freeze into cold shells against the skin. They feel efficient until the system ices over. Wool did not promise comfort. It promised stability, and in winter, stability is survival. By this point, the Vikings had built an entire chain of defense, architecture that trapped heat, bodies that shared it, platforms that broke contact with the ground, clothing that still worked when wet. But one problem remained. A longhouse was still a large space. And no matter how well it was built, it could not be heated evenly through the entire night, especially when fuel was scarce damp or reserved for cooking rather than comfort. So the Vikings made a critical decision. They stopped trying to warm everything. Instead, they warmed zones. They understood something modern heating often ignores. Heat does not spread evenly. It pools. It leaks. It escapes along the easiest paths. Wind finds seams. Cold finds shortcuts. And if you try to make an entire space equally warm, you waste precious heat fighting physics instead of using it. So sleeping areas were placed deliberately. People slept along inner walls, away from doors, away from roof seams, away from any place where drafts could still form. They chose stability over symmetry, survivability over comfort. The center of the longhouse was not the safest place. It was often the most exposed. Edges mattered. Vikings also created buffers, wooden chests, stack supplies, tools, shields, even animals. These were not stored randomly. They were positioned as thermal brakes, wine blocks, and thermal mass. Every object slowed airflow. Every surface absorbed warmth when it was available and released it slowly back into the space. Even a pile of gear could function like a wall if it blocked moving air. If a fire existed, it was secondary. A bonus. Never the foundation. Placement did the real work. Who slept where? What stood between them and the cold? Which surfaces were protected? And which parts of the longhouse were allowed to remain cold? The Vikings accepted something modern homes still fight. 
temperature would never be equal, and that was fine. They didn't need uniform warmth. They needed survivable warmth warmth where bodies rested, where children slept, where energy was conserved. Less loss, less effort. The night endured. Modern heating often does the opposite. We heat entire buildings, empty rooms, unused air, chasing perfect comfort. And the moment the system fails, the comfort collapses instantly. The longhouse did not chase comfort. It concentrated warmth where life happened and allowed the rest to remain cold. Uneven space. Living people. That was the trade. And it worked. Vikings did not survive winter because they were tougher, colder proof, or fearless. They survived because they understood heat. They knew fire was fragile. Fuel ran out. Wet wood smoked. Flames died. So they built systems that still worked without it architecture that trapped warmth bodies arranged like infrastructure platforms that broke contact with the ground wool that stayed insulating when damp and zones that concentrated heat where life mattered most. Nothing was comfortable. Nothing was wasted. Every choice defended time because time is what winter steals first. The longhouse wasn't just a shelter. It was a living system designed to hold life through the dark. Vikings didn't beat winter by fighting it. They survived by understanding it. And that's the uncomfortable lesson for modern life warmth isn't guaranteed by a device. It's guaranteed by a system. When the power fails, when the fuel is wet, when the flame dies, what remains is what you built before the night arrived.